Ever, you found yourself looking to the heavens and crying out, what is wrong with this world? You've opened the newspaper, you've turned on the news, you've been stopped having a conversation with a friend or a family member. It doesn't take very long to see that this world is filled with problems. If I asked what you thought was wrong with the world, I'm sure lots of people would give lots of different answers. You might say that there are environmental problems, global warming and rising sea levels and things like that. You might say that there are economical problems, cost of living, price of gas and electricity, um, low wages, supply chain issues. You might say it's like war in Europe and elsewhere or disease, or death on massive scales, or just individual cases. The world is filled with problems, isn't it? If you've never looked at the heavens and cried out, what's wrong with the world? Perhaps you've just stared in the mirror and asked the question, what's wrong with me? Because our lives are filled with problems and difficulties too. None of us really ever live up to the standards we set ourselves. What is wrong with you? Do you lack patience? Are you frustrated because so often you lose your rag? Do you not have too little patience? Instead, you have too much anger. You boil over, you bubble over at things that you know should not simply not provoke such a reaction. Maybe you're lonely. And you're wondering to yourself, what is it about me that keeps other people so far away? Maybe you feel that you always say the wrong thing, or you never say the right thing. Or as Paul cried out, the wrong that I do not want to do is exactly what I do, and the good that I want to do is so far away from me. What's wrong with you? What's your problem? The problems abound, don't they, in our world and in ourselves. And the next question that we might ask is, well then, if these problems are all around and all within, who's to blame? What's the source of these problems? Well, if you were just looking at those world problems, then you might pick out a few select culprits, mightn't you? You might say, oh, well, it's corporate fat cats, greedy corporate figures who, who don't care about the environment. They just want to sell us things wrapped in plastic, no matter what damage it's going to do. Or politicians, you, know, you blame them. The reason that there's this cost of living crisis is because they're lining their own pockets. They're making wrong decisions. They're doing things to secure their own power base. To hell with the rest of us. Or you might turn and Try to answer the question for yourself. What's the wrong with me? Where do these problems come from? And you might point the finger squarely at yourself. That you know you aren't the person that you ought to be. Perhaps you see that a lot of problems in your life are caused by others, those around you. You might look to your parents and say, well, you raised me. You brought me up. You shaped me. You molded me. You, you, I'm a product of my environment. And you might blame them. Or someone else, a partner, brothers, sisters, friends, work colleagues. No, it could be a whole host of answers. Problems are all around us. Who's to blame? Perhaps a better question is, well, where did these problems come from? Where did they have their beginning? Because the world wasn't always like this. The world wasn't always so riddled with death and decay and disappointment suffering, sadness, and selfishness. And our Bibles give us an answer to that question. They give us an answer to the question of who's to blame, where do our problems stem from. It gives us an origin story for the hurt and the suffering and the sinfulness that abounds. You know the origin story of humanity, no doubt. God is the one who created everything, and he created, as the pinnacle, of you, if you like, of his creation, mankind. 
humans in his image. And lovingly, he planted his people in a garden. And in that garden, he said that he provided them with everything that they needed to grow and to flourish. He even provided access to himself. We read that, don't we, in Genesis, that God walked and talked and dwelt with his people. God talked and he instructed. He gave but one command in our origin story, and the command went like this. You can eat from all the trees of the garden, but do not eat of that tree or you will surely die. Now, here's the origin story of our problems, of our pain, of our disappointments, and of death. That though God had spoken, humans questioned God. Humans chose to believe a lie, to trust in themselves over and above this one who, up until that point, had given them everything that they required. The story is more specific than that. The story is of Satan in the serpent coming and sowing the seeds of doubt. Sowing the seeds of this potential for self-government, of self-determination. Sowing the seeds of rebellion against our creator, God. And in the story, you can read it, chapter 3 of Genesis. Like a hook that had been expertly baited, humanity bit. God had warned, you eat from the tree of this fruit and uh, the fruit of this tree and you will surely die. And yet they didn't die, not in an instant anyway. It wasn't like eating a poisoned meal, but here death entered in. In Genesis chapter 3, Verses uh, 14 to 19, we actually hear the judgment that God makes on Adam and Eve's rebellion, on Adam and Eve's decision to follow their own instincts, to believe the lies of the serpent rather than to trust in God. This is what God says, and, and notice how far and how wide the implications of mankind's disobedience and sin goes. To the serpent, God said, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring, her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, God said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Death had entered in through sin. Now it has its foot in the door. If you like, it's a new fruit that's been planted in the soil of our existence and it is ready to spread everywhere. Creation feels its implications. Human relationships feel its implications. Spiritually, we feel its implications as we are cast out and cut off from God. And ultimately, this description of us dust creatures returning to the dust. People will often read that story of God coming and judging mankind's rebellion and sinfulness and we'll say to ourselves it's a bit harsh isn't it it's a bit over the top isn't it that death would enter in just because someone ate a fruit whether it's that story in particular or it's the sin in our own lives we have this tendency don't we we have this tendency to downplay 
our rebellion. It's not that bad. It's just a little bit of fruit, Adam could have said, but he didn't. I see it so often at home. I've got an 11-year-old and a 9-year-old. And the 9-year-old is crying, and the first words that come out of the 11-year-old's mouth is, well, I didn't really do anything wrong. We constantly want to downplay our own sin and our own responsibility. We either do that or put our hands up and say, it's a fair cop, I've been found out, you're exactly right what I've done. And what we do then is try and upvote our obedience. And we say, well, yes, we did eat of the fruit of that tree which you told us not to do, but don't, don't concentrate on that. Look at all the other good that I'm doing. You told us to, to multiply and be fruitful, and we are. You told us to rule and to reign, and we are. To subdue the earth and fill it, and we are. We're doing so much good. Forget about the bad. Fair game, being caught. And look at all the good that we're doing. And so we come and we read God's judgment and we think to ourselves, well, it's a bit over the top, isn't it, God? Because probably it's not as bad as, as it seems and there's an awful lot of good that's being ignored. But we must remember this, that God is just. God is right. All of his judgments are correct and true. He sees far more fully the impact of our denying him, the impact of our defending ourselves, the impact of us turning and going our own way than we can ever hope to see. In Romans chapter 3, Paul pulls together several of the Psalms to, to show how, how fully we have carried on being these sorts of people who deny God and not only are due do the, the results, the repercussions of our own disobedience, but suffer the consequences. We continue to deny God in our lives, continue to turn on each other and devour one another. And he says, bring ruin and misery in our own lives and in the lives of those around us. Let me just use an illustration. It's a bit like being allowed out for a walk bank holiday weekend I'm sure lots of people will be going on lots of walks and there will be public footpaths that have been set out so that people can go and can enjoy the wonderful Welsh weather and the scenery and all of this sort of thing but you know what happens when you decide to go off the footpath when you decide to take a different route well two things number one you start getting stung by brambles and, and barbed wire because that's just what happens when you go astray. When you go from God's good path, when you go from the public footpath, the results inevitably will be hurt and suffering. So there's a sense in which when we speak about God coming and speaking judgment and us feeling and seeing the problems and the pains in our worlds and in our lives, it's that sense of, well, what did you expect? You ignore God, you go your own way, and it leads to misery. It leads to suffering, it leads to death. You go off the footpath, you decide not to use that sty to get over that fence, but to take a shortcut and go over there, and you're going to rip your leg on the barbed wire. It's the consequence, it's the result. That's the world that you've decided to enter into. But there's another sense as well, isn't there? that if you are going off the public footpath, you are probably straying onto private land and the farmer is going to come and shoot you with a gun. Not literally, okay? That, that would be extreme. But there could be that punishment for breaking the rules, do you see? And there's that sense in God's judgment as well, that he comes and, and God who is holy, God who is just, God who is right, cannot allow sin to go unpunished. It would make him something less than perfect. It would make him something less than loving to do so. The wages of sin and rebellion, Paul says, is death. God said, if you eat of that tree, that fruit, you will surely die. And death came in. And death has been our existence ever since. That's the justice of God. And he's right 
when he makes his judgments, whether we understand it or we see it or not. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And even when God came to judge in the garden, did you spot it? There was grace. There was God coming to say what the results would be, but to make a promise of an offspring, of a seed who was going to come and make things right again. Luke chapter 23, we meet that seed, Jesus, the Son, taken on flesh, come to live in our broken world, suffering in our place. This is what we read, that when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there in the midst of criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. If you take nothing else away this evening, take this away, that the desire of God is to make a way for us. The desire of God is for us to find forgiveness for the ills in each and every one of our lives, for the rejection and the sin which has is, which is dominated our existence. The desire of God is to make a way. When we go to passages like Genesis chapter 3 and we read about God coming and judging, when we go to passages like those I've mentioned from Paul in his letter to the, to the Roman church and we think about the wages of sin being death, we can concoct in our minds this image of God as an ogre, as someone who is just watching and waiting and hoping for us to step out of line so that he can pounce on us and say, ha ha, I've caught you, you're guilty, and now you're going to have it. We can think that of God, can't we? But this is the heart of God, expressed in the life, expressed through the words of Christ as he hung on the cross in our place. Father, forgive them. The God who said that if you eat of that fruit, you will surely die. Saw to it that they, they didn't die, not immediately anyway. He continued to care for them, provide for them, and even promised that there would be a way back. There would be a way to receive forgiveness. If you take nothing else away this evening, take this, that the desire of God is that we would be forgiven. Now we don't particularly understand forgiveness, I don't think, in our modern culture. When someone wrongs us and we forgive them, it's kind of a superficial thing. It's kind of a, I want to keep you at arm's length for the rest of my life. I'm going to remove the hostility perhaps that I once had, but there's no reconciliation. There's no cost being born. There are no scars and yet with Jesus, there were scars. There were very real costs. He bears those scars still. In Matthew's gospel, his account, he records this, that from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. And then at about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sevechthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? Asked Jesus as he was wrapped in darkness. This is profound. We can't grasp this fully. The one who spoke light into the darkness now succumb to darkness in the middle of the day. The one who John described as the light of the world come into our world to shine in the darkness, now hanging helpless in the dark. He who knew no sin, becoming sin for us, in our place condemned, he standing. It's an amazing thing what Jesus did in order for us to find 
forgiveness. In John's Gospel, we read this later. Knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. Well, on the face of it, there's nothing remarkable about that, is there? He'd been arrested the night before, the evening before. He'd been um, taken into custody. From what we read about how he was treated, we can't imagine that he was fed or watered or given any sort of comfort or rest or ease during that time. So it's multiple hours later. He's been beaten. He's had to carry his cross. He's been hanging there on the cross. And he cries out, I thirst. Of course he would. But yet again, there is profound mystery here. And it shows us that this wasn't just spectacle, it was substance. That Christ really came and Christ really suffered in our place. Remember, Jesus is the one who sat at a well, offered a woman himself as a spring, as a stream of living water. That if she drank from him, she would never thirst again. And yet, here he hangs, thirsty. Christ, the eternal Son, suffered, endured, experienced all of the problems that we could mention in ourselves and in our world in a moment. Jesus bearing the full brunt of all of our sin and our misdeeds. John carries on, when Jesus had received that drink, he said this, it is is finished and with that bowed his head and gave up his spirit it is finished i was reminded last week reading for uh, another purpose but i was reminded about how how regular the system of sacrifices were in the life of israel in the life of jews daily the priest would turn up, if you like, unlock the doors of the temple and start all over again. Slaughtering, sacrificing, sin offerings, guilt offerings, praise offerings, fellowship offerings for themselves and for the people on and on and on and on with no end in sight. But this lamb, this lamb that was slain brought an end to all that ongoing atonement because he paid the price himself the substance of what jesus did was without question effective for those who believe in hebrews we read this that every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which in reality can never take away sins but when christ had come when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God because it was finished. He sat down at the right hand of God waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by one single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. What's wrong with the world? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with you? Who's to blame? Where did it come from? What's our problem? Our problem is that we have turned our back on God. Our problem is that we have chosen a life of death. But our problem is solved in Jesus. Because God desires that we be forgiven. Christ has come and Christ has suffered in our place and he declares it is finished. And I want to finish by reading you a poem. A poem that's entitled The Seed, which speaks about the origin of our problems and how Christ is the one who came to put things right. You remember the story, I hope that you do, of God who created everything, even you. When the God who spoke created, he created it good and mankind could enjoy it just as he should. But the problem with people, you'll soon come to see, is that no one is good. Not you, no, not even me. Who exactly is good? That is an important question. 
And answering that is life's most important lesson, which I heard coming from the front there a second ago. Give me a rule, and I'm sure to break it. If it looks good to my eyes, then I'm sure to take it. We see that in life, don't we? As we fight and we thieve, and we see it in the beginning with God's Adam and Eve. All that I've made is given to you freely. Every fruit, every veg, it's yours, the lot, really. But you mustn't eat the fruit from that one seed. No rules but that one, the Lord God decreed. And so they enjoyed it. The world they'd been given, living with God on earth as in heaven. They ate and they drank and were never in need, living life as they ought, how the Lord God decreed. Except until one day, when a foe, not a friend, came to whisper his lies and God's laws to amend. Really? He said that? He outlawed that seed? Are you sure you heard him right? What the Lord God decreed? Did he really say that? In God can you trust? Restricting your freedoms? Well, he treats you like dust. A God who denies you puts me at ease. So take a moment and think what the Lord God really decrees. He knows you'll be like him when you eat from that tree. The fruit he's forbidden will help you to see. Knowledge of good and what's evil proceeds. That's why he stops you, the Lord God, in decrees. So grasp your own destiny. Take life by the horns. Eat from that tree. Look, it's got no thorns. The fruit looks so tasty and ripe from that seed. Eat it now, both of you. That's my decree. The serpent had tricked them. They'd bought all his lies. Following him, not God, looked best in their eyes. So Eve took it and ate and then gave it to Adam and he ate it and enjoyed it. But at once, a great chasm. A divide had appeared, not one you could see between Adam and God and his beautiful Eve. God came to greet them and he noticed their deed and at once his heart sank. They'd broken his decree. Not me. Blame her. She's the one who led me astray. Not me either. The serpent's the one who's made us his prey. He asked if you loved us, then why you decreed? What was so terribly wonderful about that seed? And now we know. It's not the fruit that's the problem. It's our hearts. Not the rules. Our inability to follow them. So naked we stand here. Ashamed rule breakers. Rebellers against you who loved us and made us. And they were right. Of course, when they surveyed the scene, everything, all of creation had somehow lost its sheen. God had come to dwell, but not as before. He'd come to judge them for breaking his law. The verdict was labor, hard labor at that. For the man, the kind that breaks your back. For the woman, in childbirth she'd know her sentence. And death to all people, each one of their descendants. But God wasn't happy. Simply had to hand out that verdict. A promise came too, so sweet you should have heard it. A rescue will come to you both from her seed, a rescue. How wonderful what the Lord God now decreed. It won't be pretty what he'll have to do to live and to die before making things new. But I promise to you, to the creatures I love, we can be together again if you trust in his blood. Who is good? Not Adam. Not Eve. My guess it, is it isn't you either. I'm certain it's not me. Only one was good. And we know him as Jesus. And he came from the Father to save us, to free us. It was love in the beginning and love in the end. Love that created and love that repaired. God is love, I'm sure you've heard. 
But that love is seen in the incarnate word. Jesus it was who spoke the creation. Jesus it was who gave life through oration. Jesus it was who banished from Eden. Jesus it was who promised to save them. Jesus it was who took on our flesh. Jesus it was who died our death. Jesus it was and Jesus it is. It's always been Jesus. Everything is his. Jesus, it was that promised seed. He's what's good, just as the Lord God decreed.